Good morning, church. Good morning, family. I'm so excited to be uh, standing in front of you here today. Uh, and thank you to the eldership of Rooted Fellowship for this opportunity. I always uh, take it as a privilege. Uh, my name is Wangani. For those that don't know me, I'm married to my beautiful wife, Mulebo Kheng, whom I don't see. <laughs> but she's somewhere here. I, I promise she's somewhere here. Uh, we've married 12 years, actually, uh, towards the end of this year. So praise God for that. Yeah. Um, we're going to be reading through Revelation chapter 19, verse 1 until 10. Uh, I encourage you to open in your Bible. I'm reading from the CSB, but you can follow in whatever Bible, electronic or, or paper that you might have. So Revelation chapter 19, verse 1 until verse 10. <clears throat> reading from verse 1. After this, I heard something like the loud voice of a vast multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory, and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous, because he has judged the, right, the notorious prostitute who corrupted the earth with their sexual immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his servants that was on their hands. A second time they said, Hallelujah, a smoke ascends forever and ever. Then the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who is seated on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. A voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all his servants, and the ones who fear him, both small and great. Then I heard something like the voice of a vast multitude, like the sound of cascading waters and the rumbling of loud thunder, saying, Hallelujah, because our Lord God, the Almighty, reigns. Amen. Let us be glad, rejoice, and give him glory, because the marriage of the Lamb has come, Amen. and his bride has prepared herself. Yeah. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and pure. For the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. Amen. He also said to me, these words of God Amen. are true. Then I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold firmly to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Amen. Lord, as we've read our word, your word today, Lord, we pray, Lord, for all of our hearts. Holy Spirit, come into this space. We invite you, Lord, to be working in our hearts. Remove all distraction, Lord, so that, Lord, we can hear your word and hear it clearly, but also, Lord, to obey and do as we are uh, instructed in this word. And we thank you, Lord, for all of this, for your namesake and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Church, there is a party in heaven. Amen. This party is going to be epic. The party to end all parties. This party will have the largest attendance in all of human history. It will have people from everywhere, all over the world. Every tribe, every language, every people group will be at this party. It's an all-inclusive party. In this party, there will be a table, a very big table, with room for everyone in attendance to sit and enjoy good company. This party will have the best food. We've heard about some of your best food. This part, that food will be there. The choicest meats. <laughs> The choicest wines, the choicest vegan and plant-based diets for those of you <laughs> that are so inclined. This party will have the best music. They will be singing. They will be dancing. They will be rejoicing and shouts of praise to our God. Now, most parties end, but this party, family, this party will never end. They will be rejoicing, celebration, and praise of our God for all of eternity. And there is good news. If you're a Christian right now today, you already have your ticket to this party. You accepted the invitation when you surrendered your life to the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're not a Christian today, then there's, there's an envelope, an unread email in your inbox that contains your invitation. All you have to do is open the doors of your heart and accept the invitation. You need to RSVP. Now, I know what many of you are thinking, right? What is heaven celebrating? There's a big party, right? There's a big table. But what is the occasion? Well, that is the purpose of our text today in Revelation chapter 19, verse 1 until verse 10. Now, we will not cover absolutely everything systematically today. There simply would not be enough time for that, right? I know you guys have Sunday meals prepared, much like what we're going to talk about today, so we can't go through absolutely everything. But what we will do, we will zoom in on the wedding feast of the Lamb, and we'll, it will be supported by its rich, rich theological context, both in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. We'll unpack this heavenly party together to discover why we are celebrating what we are celebrating, and who we are celebrating. 
Now, to do this properly, we need to locate this party within the wider narrative of the whole Bible, specifically in the Old Testament. This concept of being able to commune and eat with God. Genesis chapter 2, verse 9 says the following, The Lord God caused to grow out of the ground every tree pleasing in appearance and good for food, including the tree of life in the middle of the garden. So Adam and Eve ate the food of the garden, the food that God had provided. And whilst it's not mentioned in Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 makes it clear that God used to walk in the garden. So the implication is there, and it's clear that Adam and Eve ate with and in the presence of God. Exodus chapter 18, verse 12 says the following, Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat meat with Moses' father-in-law in God's presence. When the Israelites had defeated the Amalekites in Rephidim, Moses' father-in-law went to the camp of the Israelites to celebrate and praise God with Moses for everything God had done, especially the rescue of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. So Moses, his father-in-law Jethro, and all the elders of Israel ate with and in the presence of God. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 7, You will eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice with your household in everything you do, because the Lord your God has blessed you. Here God is giving instructions to the Israelites on what to do when they possess the land that he had given them. And again, the instructions are very clear. When they have defeated the enemies of God and his people, they are to eat in the presence of God. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 21 to 22. The following day they offered sacrifices to the Lord and burnt offerings to the Lord. A thousand bulls, a thousand rams, a thousand lambs, along with their drink offerings, and sacrifices in abundance for all Israel. They ate and drank with great joy in the Lord's presence that day. So David, his son Solomon, and the congregation of Israel ate in the presence of God as they prepared to build the temple. Here's another one that most of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with. Psalm chapter 23, uh, the Lord is my shepherd. Verse 5 says, you prepare, what? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Now, I think most of us get that God prepares a table in the presence of our enemies. But who do we sit with on this table? We're sitting with God himself. It is God who is our host. Church, I could go on and on and on, and I think you get the point, so I will stop here. In fact, I found over 30 references of people eating in the presence of God or eating with God in the Old Testament. Pastor John last week went through, I don't know how many occasions where Jesus was calling people to eat with him at the table. Men and women eating with God in the Old Testament. Now, when we see men and women communing and eating with God, it is usually because they are celebrating God's victory over their enemies, or we are celebrating the goodness and blessing of God. It is simply a sign that we are the people of God, that we belong to Him. That's what it means to eat with God. This act of eating with God is a time of rejoicing, praising, and enjoying company with God and each other. And guess what? We will see many of those same elements today in Revelation chapter 19. And, and the trick family, to understand Revelation lies in the Old Testament. You cannot understand Revelation without first going through the Old Testament. Church, the table matters. The table matters. It's what we are made for. We are made to commune and eat and drink with God and with each other. The table matters. The table mattered in the Old Testament. The table matters in the New Testament. And the table will continue to matter for all of eternity. The table matters. Now, last week and, and, and the week before that, Pastor Jonah gave us starters to sample. He also gave us the amazing mains that we had to enjoy uh, last week. But you know what comes with the mains, right? That's right. It's dessert time. It's dessert time. And believe you me, family, there is dessert in Revelation. It hit me like a ton of bricks when I saw it, and I hope that you see it, that you see it here today. Now, I know all of, all of us are excited to, to get to the wedding feast of the Lamb and the dessert that follows thereafter. I'm excited too, but before we can get to that family, before the feast and dessert can start, three things must first happen in our passage today. The first thing is God must be victorious over the great prostitute Babylon. The second thing that must happen is the Lamb of God must come back to collect his bride. Then the third thing that must happen is the church must make herself ready for the arrival of the groom. Then, family, only then can the wedding feast of the Lamb yeah. begin. Okay, so let's go through those three points, and then we can get into our meal for today. The first thing that must happen, God must triumph over the great harlot. And I'll use the word harlot, prostitute, and war interchangeably. It's just the way my brain works, so go with it. 
Um, yeah, so God must triumph over the great harlot Babylon. And I'll read verse 1 until verse 3 of our text. Now, after this, I heard something like the loud voice of a vast multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory, and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous, because he has judged the notorious prostitute who corrupted the earth with her sexual immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his servants that was on their hands. A second time they said, Hallelujah, her smoke ascends forever and ever. Now, just like in the Old Testament, where the people celebrated and ate with God after the defeat of his enemies, we see exactly the same pattern here in Revelation chapter 19. Now, you can ask yourself, what, what has the harlot or the prostitute Babylon done? Well, the harlot had corrupted the whole earth with her whoring. We see that in chapter 19, verse 2 of our text. But I actually want to read it for you from chapter 14, verse 8. It says the following. And another, a second angel, followed saying, It has fallen. Babylon the great has fallen. She made all the nations drunk with her sexual immorality, which brings wrath. You see, she turned people and the nations farther and farther away from God, and she turned their allegiance to herself. She did this through her deceptive economic, political, and corrupted religious influence over the nations. She got them drunk with their wine so that they were all in with their idolatry. Now, Babylon here in this vision is a clear reference to the historical Babylon in the Old Testament, the enemy of the people of God. In fact, if you read Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 7, you will see that Babylon has been up to the same old tricks for a very long time. Yeah. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 7 says the following, Babylon was a gold cup in the Lord's hand, making the whole earth drunk. The nations drank her wine, therefore the nations go mad. Yeah. So in the Old Testament and in Revelation, Babylon has been up to the same old tricks of corrupting the nations with their whoring. But the big, that begs the question, why is Revelation, right, referring to Babylon, even though we know the historical Babylon fell uh, in 539 BC? Well, you see, most commentators agree that Babylon here stands for any world economic, political, and, and corrupted religious power that rises up, amasses great wealth and influence over the nations, and turns people away from the worship of God to yeah. the worship of idols. Yeah. That's what Babylon is. It's just the latest iteration of the next superpower that turns people away from the worship of the true God. John's readers would have understood Babylon here to be referring to Rome, which was the dominant economic and political power of their time. For us here today, it is any world system that rises up, corrupts people, and turns them from the worship of God to idolatry. Church, Babylon is the antithesis of the church. You see, while the true church is turning people to the worship of the true God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the false church is busy turning people away to the worship of of idols. While we busy plotting, how can we bring out one more? Pastor Ono challenges us to bring out one more to church. The world is not taking it lying. Right. It's recruiting its own one mores yes. to the world. Yes. Yes. That's how you often hear reformed Christians, and I agree with them. I'm a reformed Christian. Everyone goes to church. Everyone goes to church. The question is, which church do you attend? Is it the church of the world or is it the true church of Christ? Sure. That is the question this morning. Now, there's a second thing that, uh, you know, that Babylon does that is deserving of wrath, the wrath of God, her judgment. And that is in our text in verse 2 again, but again, I want to read it from chapter 17, verse 6. That is, she murders the saints. See, the false church harlot doesn't just turn people away from the worship of the true God to idolatry, a bad enough thing in and of itself, but she also murders Christians. Revelation chapter 17, verse 6 says the following, Then I saw the woman who was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses, to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Church, persecution is real. Yeah. And some may lose their lives for the sake of the gospel. It's happening all over the world. The forces of evil are not happy with us following the true God. And if they fail to turn us away from the true God, then they may even resort to murdering us. The blood of the martyrs all over the world cries, how long, how long, O oh God, until you avenge our blood? How long, Revelation chapter 6, verse 10. But God will not let the crimes of the great harlot go unpunished, family, if there is good news. He will not let the blood of the martyrs go unpunished. Amen. Revelation chapter 19, verse 2 in our text says, Because his judgments are true and righteous, because he has judged the notorious prostitute who corrupted the earth with their sexual immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his servants yeah. that was on their hands. Church, God's judgments are always right and true. Yeah. He Amen. will be victorious over the nations, and he will avenge the blood of all the martyrs. That day is coming. John has seen it in his vision. 
those that were murdered and all those that have endured till the end will not cry forever. They will be rejoicing and praising their God in heaven. Yeah, Notice how many times all of heaven repeat the word hallelujah in our text today. Verse 1, hallelujah. Verse 3, hallelujah. Verse 4, hallelujah. Verse 6, hallelujah. All of heaven rejoices at the judgment of the great harlot, and their tears have turned into joy because she can no longer corrupt the nations nor murder the saints. These scenes in heaven are meant to be a clear contrast to the mourning that is happening in Babylon because of her judgment, demonstrated by its inhabitants crying out, whoa, whoa, three times over in Revelation chapter 18 between verses 9 and 19. I'll read you one of those woes for your edification. Revelation chapter 18 verse 10 says the following, they will stand far off in fear of her torment, saying, woe, woe the great city, Babylon, the mighty city, for in a single hour your judgment has come. So while the false church harlot is lamenting a, judge, a judgment, the true church and all of heaven will celebrate God's victory over hell. So that is the first thing, family, that must happen before this party can begin. The second thing that must happen is the Lamb of God must come back to collect his bride. Jesus is coming back, amen? Amen. 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 And so with the defeat of Babylon, Christ Jesus is now ready to come and collect his bride, the true church, in an epic marriage celebration for the ages. Uh, verse 7 of our text says the following, Let us be glad, rejoice, and give him glory, because the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has prepared herself. Now, in order to understand this piece of text more deeply, we need to briefly review the marriage customs of the Jews in John's time. See, first would be the betrothal. And you can think of the betrothal kind of like our engagement, although a betrothal was much more binding uh, in that time. The betrothal terms are agreed in the presence of witnesses, obviously between the two families, but are agreed in the presence of witnesses, and God's blessing is pronounced over that union. Then there is an interval period. This, this interval period is, is the time where uh, between the betrothal and the wedding feast, uh, where, where it would begin. So this time in between that betrothal and when the wedding feast would begin, they would call that the interval. Now, during this interval, the groom would typically pay the dowry to the father of the bride. It is during this time that one of the preparations the groom would do is to go away to his father's house, or if he had the means, to build a new one and prepare room to receive his bride on their wedding night. Otherwise, where would you receive, receive your bride? And at the end of the interval comes the procession. And at this time, in parallel, the bride would prepare herself and adorn herself with fine linen and perfume and all manner of goodness while the groom, accompanied by his friends, would sing and bear torches and proceed in a procession to the home of the betrothed to go and fetch his bride. And depending on the distance between the two homes, uh, so if it was very far, they would do everything in that, uh, where, at, the, at the bride's house. Otherwise, there would also be a returning procession. Now, this time, the procession is with the bride as well, right, uh, as the groom. And when they arrive at the groom or his father's house, the wedding feast would begin, which includes a marriage supper. And these activities would typically last seven or more days. That's how the Jews used to do it in John's time. Now, church, I'm sure many of you already have already caught on to the imagery that this portrays. Time and time again, in both the Old and New Testaments, the love relationship between a groom and his bride has been compared to that of God and his people yeah. and Christ and the church. The former is but a faint reflection of the glory of the latter. The church is betrothed, the church is betrothed to Christ Jesus. The Father has pronounced his blessing over the union. Jesus has paid the dowry. He paid it with his own blood when he died on the cross for his bride. Yeah. He paid it to rescue his bride from the clutches of sin and death. He has now gone away to his father's house to prepare a room where he will receive his bride, the church. John chapter 14, verse 1 to 3 says the following. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. Jesus is coming. He has not left us here without hope. He has paid the dowry and is surely coming back. He is coming back to collect us and to go home with him. And when we go back with him, then the party can begin. The biggest feast you have ever seen as we celebrate our union with the Lamb of God. Church, we're in the interval period right now. And what comes after the interval? It's the procession. Jesus will come back in his full glory, flanked by the angels on either side in the greatest procession that would have been ever seen. This procession will be going directly to the world and it will be to collect his bride and we'll go back with him. 
We will join the multitudes in heaven in declaring hallelujah because the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us be glad, rejoice, and give him glory because the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has prepared herself. It's going to happen. Now, I don't know about you. Verse 7 is quite curious, which is I would have expected Jesus or the picture of Jesus used in verse 7 uh, to be that of a warrior, the lion of Judah, on his, of Judah on his wedding day. But it is not. Now, why would it be the case that in the day of his celebration, Jesus is portrayed in the image of a lamb in John's vision? And quite simply, the reason is Christ's glory is most visible in his suffering for sinner. The great preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who reflected and, and preached on this uh, on August 21st, 18, 21st, 1887, I'm very sure none of you were born at that time. Um, I cannot conceive of the Lord Jesus Christ ever being less than infinitely glorious. But dear friends, if there is ever a time when we can appreciate the splendor of his character more fully than at other times, it is when he is on the cross, when he dies. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Spurgeon goes on to say, the glory of man consists in what we are prepared to suffer for others. The glory of a king must be not in the crowns he wears, but in what he does for his subjects. And Christ's glory is most seen in his sacrifice for sinners. You see, Jesus is portrayed here in verse 7 as the Lamb of God, not as a sign of weakness. It's not a sign of weakness, but it's a sign of his magnificent glory. He's portrayed in this way so that we can all the more, along with all the hosts of heaven, say with the surest conviction, let us be glad, rejoice, and give him glory because the marriage of the Lamb has come. So that is the second thing, family, that must happen. Jesus must come back to collect his bride. The third thing that must happen, the church must make herself ready for the arrival of the groom. We must. The second part of verse 7 and verse 8 says the following, and his bride has prepared herself. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. Church, you and I know that this vision of this perfected church is not yet 100% consistent with our experience of the church, whether it's global or even our own local church. But John wants to remind you this morning of something. There will be a time when the church will be perfect in every way, perfect in every way. It will be beautiful, wearing fine linen, which is bright and pure. Pastor Oni has said many times that church and community can be messy. It can be. You put a you know, whole bunch of imperfect people in a room and there's bound to be friction at some point. It happens. But one thing is guaranteed. Don't lose family hope. Don't, 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 lose, don't lose hope, family. Don't go rejecting and losing all hope in the church uh, because of that. There is hope. One thing is guaranteed, and that is while the false church harlot of the world is getting progressively worse, the true church of Christ is being sanctified and perfected, and one day that process will be completed. So don't lose hope, family. Bear with us. Let's get sanctified together. Let's do life together. We know for a fact that one day we'll be perfect together. And when that perfection is achieved, all of heaven will celebrate the revealing of the true bride of Christ, perfect and beautiful in every way. To put it simply, the church will turn heads. It will turn heads. When the church walks down that aisle, it will turn heads. Yeah. All of heaven will look and marvel at her beauty. It will be beautiful. You will be beautiful. Turn to somebody and say, you are, you are beautiful. And together we're going to be even more beautiful still. Amen. That is the promise of Revelation chapter 19. And notice something else about the expression of the church's beauty in this text. I'll read our, 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 the second part of 7 and 8 again. His bride has prepared herself. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. So the bride, the church, has prepared herself for the marriage feast, but at the same time, the fine linen was given to her to wear. So, so which one is it? Did she prepare herself, or was it given to her to be prepared? Sidebar for the Bible nerds, I'm a Bible nerd. Um, the fine linen here is a contrast to the purple and scarlet clothes that Babylon wears in Revelation, early in Revelation. Right, so the contrast of Babylon here is contrasted against the church. It's the same thing when you hear the city of Jerusalem. Babylon is also a city, right? The contrast is there, it's clear. That one is for free, I don't know why I said that, but I just felt I need to say it. Anyway, back to the point, while the righteous acts of the saints are not necessary for salvation, they are, however, necessary as proof of the transformation that has happened internally in our hearts. You see, God initiates salvation, but our righteous acts act as a matter of proof of that salvation. To put it more simply, our righteous acts are part of what will adorn the church in great 
beauty on that day. Our righteous acts matter. Your acts of obedience matter. Your righteous acts matter. What you do in service of God and of others, it matters. It'll be part of the great tapestry of linen that will adorn the church on the great wedding feast of the Lamb. And I wonder if you've ever thought of it that way, that our acts of obedience, our acts of righteousness adorn and add to the beauty and radiance of the church. Part of what makes Rooted Fellowship beautiful is that we have members, we have deacons, we have elders that are obedient to the master, Jesus Christ. Can you imagine if none of those people are obedient? We'll lose our beauty, we'll lose our radiance. So thank God that we have obedient people, people that are actively following the example of Christ Jesus uh, in this church. That is part of what makes us beautiful. That is what, what is part of what will make the church beautiful, the global church beautiful on that great wedding feast. It is honoring to the bridegroom that we make ourselves ready. Imagine if you, you know, if you got married, I got married 12 years ago, almost, and my wife just simply wasn't ready. And it's not that she wasn't ready, it's just like she forgot her wedding day. <laughs> you know, like, because I know some of you were late, you know, like, I, I get it, ladies, getting ready, is, it, it takes time. Maybe that's why Jesus, you know, is giving us time, because it knows it takes time. <laughs> I, I get all of that. But imagine if she just wasn't ready at all. It'd be absolutely discouraging, right? It'd be discouraging. But if you find your, your bride has made herself ready and is beautiful, then it is honoring to you as the bridegroom. Wow. Church, it is honoring to Christ Jesus when we prepare ourselves and be ready for his return through our acts of obedience. It is absolutely honoring to Christ Jesus. So that is the third thing that must happen, right? The church must make herself ready. It is given to us to be ready. Now let's make ourselves ready. Let's make ourselves ready. Right, the stage is now set. The false church harlot has been defeated, and the true church, full of splendor and beauty, has been revealed. And the bridegroom has come. He has come to collect his bride and to take her home. Now the marriage feast of the Lamb can commence. This is it, family, the moment we have all been waiting for. Revelation chapter 19, verse 9 says the following. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. He also said to me, these words of God are true. Now, the word feast in the CSB is deepno in the Greek, and it can also be translated into supper or banquet or feast, as is the case here in the CSB, which is why you will see many translations use differences uh, in that word. But whichever word you choose to use, the meaning is clear. The celebration will be over food and drink. That's right, there will be food and drink yes. at this wedding feast. It is equivalent to the feast in the kingdom of God in Luke chapter 14, verse 15 and following yes. that Jesus speaks about. It is where all believers from every nation will gather together to celebrate God's final work of salvation and restoration. All the various occasions of God's people eating with and in the presence of God in the Old Testament, and all the various occasions when Jesus welcomed people to sit with him at a table, were all pointing to this great day. They've all been pointing forward to the great wedding feast of the Lamb. And make, make no mistake, church, we'll be gathered around a table. And in this table will be all manner of fine foods. And how do I know this? Well, I know this because the Bible says so. Uh, Isaiah chapter 25, uh, verse 6 to 10, and Isaiah finds this fulfillment, by the way, in the, in the wedding feast of the Lamb. So Isaiah essentially prophesying about this day says the following. On this mountain, which is Zion, the Lord of armies will prepare for all peoples, peoples a feast of choice meat, a feast with aged wine, prime cuts of choice meat, vintage fine wine. On this mountain, he will swallow up the burial shroud, the shroud over all the peoples, the sheet covering all the nations. When he has swallowed up death once and for all, the Lord will, God will wipe away all the tears from their faces and remove his people's disgrace from the whole earth. For the Lord God has spoken. Amen. We'll be eating the choicest meat. Prime cuts of meat. Not the cheap ones. No, no. We'll be, we'll be drinking fine and vintage wines. Not the cheap ones. You know, when I talk about, uh, you know, what is, what is that steak that we all like from, from, from the East, Japan? Is it Waigu? It's Waigu steak. Have you ever heard of a tomahawk? I love tomahawks. What about ribeye? It will be there. Fine, prime cuts of meat. That bottle of wine that you bought from Woolies, the one that costs 150 rand, it's not the one. There, there are 2,000 rand <laughs> bottles of wine. There's levels to this thing. Those are the ones that God will be bringing out on that day. Notice that it doesn't say anything about plant-based options. Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, uh, in Kateko. 
It's, it's in the Bible, it's not me. <laughs> Oh, white, grapes white, okay, all right, all right. Look, all I have to say to you is not too late to switch back to the heavenly menu. <laughs> In all seriousness, though, uh, the point here, guys, is, is clear. God is an amazing host. Yeah. He will not spare any expense in bringing us the finest foods and the finest wines at the wedding feast of his son. How can he? He did not spare his own son for our own sake. Yeah. Providing the finest foods and drink, even the plant-based ones, is small waters for him. It's nothing. He will do it. He will do it. I can already hear some of you saying, you promised us dessert. Where is dessert? Where is dessert? Now, before you riot, don't worry, God's got this. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 22, verse 1 until 2. And just thematically, so I position it for you, Revelation chapter 19, the text that we read, thematically belongs with chapter 20 to 22. It is when we celebrate our final victory in Christ Jesus, the recreation of the new heavens and earth, the new Eden, Jerusalem coming down and, and, and descending and becoming the new city, the eternal city of God. It belongs together. So the wedding feast will lead directly into that. Chapter, chapter 22, verse 1 to 2 says the following. Then he showed me the river of water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the city's main street. The tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are edible somehow. They are for the healing of the nations. So there are two ingredients to this dessert. One is a drink, and the other is a food item. The first ingredient of the dessert is the water of life to wash down the amazing mains we would have had. And this water will satisfy and sustain us forever. The second ingredient of the dessert are the fruits and leaves of the tree of life. The tree of life is back, and this time it's not just one tree. It's multiple trees on either side of the river of life, a whole park of trees everywhere in the new city of Jerusalem so that we may always have access to a sweet, sweet dessert that nourishes us with life everlasting. The tree of life this time produces 12 different kinds of fruit, not one, 12 different kinds of fruit, one for each month, representing an abundance of variety in heaven. The leaves of the tree of life too are edible and they bring healing, they bring healing to the nations. Man, everywhere you go in the new Jerusalem will be food and drink that nourishes us with life and satisfies us forever. Are you thirsty? Take and drink of the water of life. Are you hungry? Take and eat of all the different kinds of fruit in the trees of life. There's abundance in heaven. There's absolute abundance of food in heaven. Now, I believe some of you will be taking some of the water of life, gathering some of the fruits that are, uh, you know, that, 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 that are produced every season, and the leaves, and making the meanest desserts. I know some of you are so gifted that have been to your houses. <laughs> That's right. Can you imagine a heavenly fruitcake made from the fruits of the trees of life? Oof, I want it right now. What about a heavenly tiramisu? with toppings of fruit. Some of you are going, what is a tiramisu? Well, I, all I have to say to you is, you need to go Google that, make it for your family. What about my personal, you know, my personal favorite, grilled fruit skewers? Ever heard of that? Have you ever done that, grilled fruit? No? Amazing. After you've fried your meat, take some fruits, chop them up, skewer them, you put them on the fire, and that meat flavor just goes all over them. It's just amazing. It's just amazing. I believe we'll enjoy these and other desserts forever. And just so that we don't miss the point of the source of these desserts, Revelation chapter 22 verse 1 tells us that the river of water of life flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb and waters the trees of life in the city. The point is clear. The heavenly desserts that we'll enjoy come from God himself. Amen. The ultimate source of our eternal life yeah. is God himself. So church, I hope that this has given you a foretaste of what is to come. A hunger, figuratively and literally perhaps, for heaven. Something to look forward to. And a reminder, if you're a Christian, then you're already invited to this wedding feast. And if you're not, then there's an invitation waiting for you. All you have to do is just simply RSVP and accept it. I'm going to ask the band to come up as I just land the plane, as I park the train at the stations. And so we end the sermon in the same way that we began it, by saying that the table matters. Think about it. Every time you as a people gather together over a meal, you are quickening the arrival of this day. You are pointing forward to the great wedding feast of the Lamb. 
And since we know that every time two or three gather in his name, there Jesus will be also, Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. And so don't look down on your gatherings, family. It may be small. It may be a few people, but guess what? You are participating in the age-old practice of eating in the presence of God. That's what you're doing. So don't look down on your table. It is a sanctified space where we can feast and celebrate God's work of salvation and look forward to the day when the work is completed. It also means that every single time two or three of you are gathered in his name and then invite somebody that doesn't know Jesus, that you are in fact inviting them to a meal with Jesus. That's what you're doing. Your own home, your own table can be a space where you can invite people for a meal with Jesus. And so in the season of Hashtag More, don't neglect the, the table family. It is a powerful means of spreading the gospel and inviting people to a meal with Jesus. Pastor Oni has challenged us to invite our one more. And I know many of you are like, how do I do that? Well, have you considered gathering a few of your brothers and sisters and inviting somebody that doesn't know Jesus to a meal? That's one way to do it. The Great Commission is for all of us, and there are many ways to fulfill it. One means that we've been given, one with eternal significance, and one that will be practiced for all of eternity is through simply inviting people around the table to share a meal with Jesus. And so here's a challenge for you, church. Eat and run. Pastor Jonah was talking about it earlier. He's starting up again. Won't you invite somebody to a meal with Jesus? Family groups and expansion groups have started up again. Won't you invite somebody to a meal with Jesus? Your own table at home. Is it a space that is welcoming to people that want and need a meal with Jesus? Now, we've had response cards up in front and at the back throughout this series. And I invite you again today to, as you ponder and respond uh, to the sermon, think about somebody that you can write down on that, that we can pray for, that you can invite either to your own house, to a lehotla, to church, to your family group, to wherever, invite that person to a meal with Jesus. And then, and then obey. Go and do it. And then go and do it. Let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, we're so thankful. We're so blessed by everything you have done. You're the Lion of Judah, but you're also the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We thank you, Lord, and we give you all the glory. We can't wait, Lord, for that day when you come to fetch us, Lord. And we pray, Lord, as, that as we await that time, as we're in the interval period, we pray that you may prepare our hearts, prepare our minds. Help us, Lord, to do your work in this world so that more can be invited to that great wedding day. And when that day happens, Lord, we are so looking forward to it, Lord. We pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. You want the wedding feast to begin. We want the new heaven and earth, Lord. We want everything to be recreated anew. A world where there's no cry, no tears, no pain, no fear. A world where we can worship you forever, commune, eat, and drink with you and each other forever and ever. We pray all of this, Lord, for in your wonderful name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.